Okay, thank you, Angela. Okay. All right, next up. Um, OCTA is still weird to me, so this definitely qualifies still for this uh, session. Uh, Amro Omar Omari, one of our first year, uh, our first year Retina Fellow, will be giving our next his our next talk uh, titled "The Role of OCTA." All right, hello everybody. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about OCTA because I feel like it's a very useful clinical tool that um, is going to explode in terms of what we can do with it, and there's going to be a lot of great things both ocular and systemically. So background, OCT angiography, what's nice about it, it's a non-invasive way to image the blood vessels of the retina and the choroid. First clinical trials using this modality were done in 2014, and it functions through low coherence interferometry. And basically the way that it works is it takes repeated A scans through a certain section. And then through variations in signal, that's how we take as a surrogate for blood flow. So let's just review our normal anatomy. Of course, the picture on the top is the um, just a standard OCT showing the different layers of the retina. Now on the bottom here, you've got the um, cross-sectional OCTA showing the different capillary plexuses of the retina. So you've got the RPCP, the radial peripapillary capillary plexus, and the superficial um, vascular plexus, which is in the RNFL and ganglion cell layer. Then the intermediate and the deep capillary plexi are straddling the INL. And so how OCTA segments that is it produces a superficial vascular complex and a deep vascular complex for those two regions. And then it produces an avascular segment for the ONL, which as we know is a watershed area. And that's very important clinically when it comes to lesions like PAM and stuff like that. So this is the standard segment that we get on the OCTA. You get the avascular, which corresponds to vitreoretinal interface and is very useful for characterizing neovascularization from diseases such as diabetic retinopathy, where the neovascular fronds grow in the subhyloid space. The superficial and the deep capillary plexi, plexi we already discussed. The avascular we also discussed. Then you've got the choriocapillaris and then the choroid, including the Sattler's and Haller's layers. Let's talk about some of the advantages. So we also talked about um, you know, how it's non-invasive, it's quicker, you know, just because it's quicker obviously doesn't mean it's better, but, you know, we're going to list that it's much faster, obviously, than a standard fluorescein angiogram and precludes the needs for injectable dyes that can produce anaphylactic shock, right? So there are cases, unfortunately, people who even die from fluorescein angiography, right? So it can also provide 3D information. And it can provide quantitative analyses of vascular density, which fluorescein angiogram cannot. You can just quantify, well, there's capillary loss, there isn't. But on OCTA, you can actually quantify the amount. The main disadvantage is it does not, as of yet, provide information on leakage in the same manner as an FA and doesn't go as wide currently as standard fluorescein, of which we'll discuss later for the future applications. Artifact is another disadvantage. So any imaging is prone to issues with media opacity, motion artifact, that's, you know, standard. Some things that are a little bit more specific to OCTA are projection artifact, where by virtue of the mechanism, of how it works, um, light rays that are deflect, reflected from deeper retinal layers will interfere with the signal from the item of interest. And segmentation errors can also be a source of error and confusion for us as we're interpreting them. Because for example, if you have a choroidal neovascular membrane or a uh, PED, it might be difficult to discern um, exactly where the abnormal blood vessel is coming from. And if you just rely on the standard segmentation that OCTA produces, you might be misled. And then the extra vascular artifact is when actually, because we discussed how motion is how it produces the image, if you get exudate within pockets of macular edema that are moving, it will also produce artifact outside of the vessels. These are the machines that we have available. And then let's talk about the standard three clinical applications. If we were to summarize, it's basically the three important things are A, quantifying macular ischemia, B, looking at choroidal neovascular membranes, and then C, looking at retinal neovascularization. So let's talk about the first application here. So let's say you have a patient in clinic 
They have PDR, they have no macular edema, the media is clear for once, and um, you're not sure why the vision's down. Well, you, you've got two patients here, one to the left and then one to the right of one having moderate NPDR. I think this is blocking it, but that's okay. So this patient here on the left has moderate NPDR without significant macular ischemia. They do have a fairly irregular FAZ, but then if you look on the right, both for the superficial and the deep capillary plexus, there is an increase in size and irregularity in the foveal avascular zone. So application number one, which is very important currently in the way we use it. Number two is to look at retinal neovascularization. Now I'm giving this example for a patient because oftentimes when we're looking at our PDR patients, we're not sure is the NV that we're looking at active or inactive. And what uh, OCTA can do quite nicely is it can look at the flow and provide that for you. So you see here, for example, a patient with the neovascularization of the disc that is active as compared to neovascularization of the disc that is inactive. These are just fibrotic um, uh, strands across the arcades that clearly do not have flow as shown in that bottom left picture. So let's talk about another really important clinical application, which is looking at dry versus wet macular degeneration. So the patient on the left has just the dry form, and you can see the color fundus photo labeled A that just shows drusen with OCTB scan showing drusenoid PEDs. When you look at the OCTA, the segment corresponding to C, which is the choriocapillaris, does not show a vascular complex. And D, quite nicely on the B scan, shows no flow within that. Contrast that to the patient with wet AMD, who has a trace sliver of subretinal fluid as depicted by the yellow arrow, and a clear choroidal neovascular complex in F, which is the um, segmented layer for the choroidal vascular networks. And then you can clearly see that there's flow within those networks on image G. Future directions now. So we kind of alluded to this earlier, and I think that ultra wide field OCTA will really be advantageous. Here's an example of an ultra wide field OCTA, which we do not have here yet at Shea, but showing clearly the non perfusion nasally in a diabetic patient with neovascularization. And as our anterior segment colleagues from glaucoma know very well, there's been no shortage of NVG recently. Um, if you look at the patient, so this is the same patient with NVG of the left eye, you can use OCTA to evaluate for rubiosis. So A is the normal right eye, and then B is the abnormal left eye with extensive neovascularization of the iris that is much more apparent than the slip lamp photo in C. And some very, very exciting new studies that are coming out that showing that OCTA can actually be a biomarker for some systemic diseases. So for both preclinical Alzheimer's and in coronary artery disease. And it may be a matter of time, could be something in the future where our colleagues from other specialties may ask us to weigh in on vascular diseases based on the status of how the retinal vasculature looks as well. So thank you, of course, Dr. Brocker, Dr. Chibolu, my co-fellow who is helpful with uh, with preparing, and then the Alumni Day Committee, and also to Dr. Mian, who was my mentor while I was a medical student at the University of Michigan. So thank you.